You know, for the longest time, I always wanted to do an extended review on the movie Fatima, which is this 2020 film which obviously dramatizes the various Mary apparitions to the so-called three children of Fatima, including Lucia, Jacinta, and Francisco in 1917. Now, hopefully it goes without saying, major spoiler alert, right? So if you have seen it, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. But if you haven't seen it, you really should, because quite honestly, it is one of the best religious movies I have ever seen in my entire life. So the first thing that comes to mind is the importance of praying with simplicity, faith, and conviction. And so in this regard, a couple of passages come to mind from the gospel. So first of all, the gospel of Matthew chapter 11, where the Lord very famously says, do not heap up empty phrases like the Gentiles do. But secondly, from the gospel of Mark chapter 6, where he says, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and will be given unto you. And so again, the underlying idea is when you pray, pray with faith, simplicity, and conviction. And so, for example, at the very beginning of the film, we see this really great scene where Lucia has this encounter with the angel of Portugal, who grants her this somewhat horrific image of World War I, including an image of her brother, Manuel, who is basically struggling in the midst of battle. As a result of which, Lucia turns to the angel for guidance, and the angel leads her to pray. But instead of giving her a really lengthy and complex prayer, the angel basically says to her, pray like this, I believe, I have hope, and I love God. Now, you find a similar thing going on in the context of the various Mary apparitions that you find throughout the course of the movie. And so, for example, in the context of the first apparition, the Blessed Mother turns to the three children and says to them, pray the rosary daily to bring peace to the world and an end to the war. In the context of the second apparition, Our Lady turns to the kids and says to them, continue to pray the rosary daily and learn how to read. It is very important. In the context of the third apparition, Mary says to them, pray and repent for your sins. And then finally, in the context of the fourth apparition, Our Lady turns to the children and says to them, do not insult the Lord. He is already very insulted. In any case, we could probably go on and on with all sorts of different examples. But the underlying point here is that when it comes to a particular practice of the faith, instead of looking, for example, for another book or another quote or another clever way to express a particular point of doctrine, Perhaps we simply need to get back to basics and live the spiritual life with faith, simplicity, and conviction. Anyways, the second thing that came to mind when I was watching this film was the importance of living our faith always with a particular eye towards a relationship with Christ as opposed to merely a collection of thoughts, ideas, or principles. And so the example that comes to mind in the context of the film, when Our Lady appears to the three children for the second time, Lucia takes it upon herself to ask Our Lady to heal this young boy named Diego, who's basically been unable to walk since his youth. And Mary responds. And so basically what she says to the people is, Diego will be healed, but only if he starts believing. But you see, what's interesting is that instead of responding to this promise of healing with gratitude and faith, the people start to grumble. And so, for example, one person basically says, well, well look, he's already a believer. Another person says, well, she says he's going to be healed, but, but when? As a result of which, the smile on Mary's face suddenly fades, and she pulls this outer garment away from her chest to reveal that her immaculate heart is basically bleeding, which prompts Lucia to say to her, Oh, I'm sorry, Mother. As a result of which, Mary's smile finally returns. You know, Bishop Robert Barron has a really interesting point in this regard when he speaks about the notion of conscience. And so what he basically says is that when we paint a bad picture, for example, or when we swing a golf club badly, we don't feel like we've offended anyone. But in contrast, when it comes to the moral life, when we do a bad thing, we do feel like we've offended one whom we should love with our whole heart. And the whole idea, of course, is that when it comes to the moral life, or when it comes to the spiritual life in general, rather than practice our faith purely in terms of abstract thoughts and ideas and principles, we should always situate this practice in terms of our relationship with Christ, the one whom we are called to love with our entire being. In any case, the final thing I kind of want to bring to your attention is the importance of putting our primary focus on actually doing the will of God, as opposed to carrying out our particular plans, even if those plans were originally conceived with the explicit intention of bringing glory to God, if that makes any sense. And so, for example, in the context of the Gospels, you find this particular principle at work in the life of the Blessed Virgin Mary herself, particularly in the context of the Annunciation, which of course you find in the Gospel of Luke. And so, as you might recall, in the context of that particular story, 
The angel Gabriel appears to the Blessed Virgin Mary and invites her to become the mother of the Savior. In response to which Mary says, how can this be since I am a virgin? Now, the thing I want to impress upon you is that when Mary asks the angel this particular question, it's not because she doesn't know where babies come from, right? She asks this question as a point of clarification. Do you want me to become the mother of God and still remain a virgin? Which speaks to the fact that Mary's intention from the very beginning, even before the appearance of the angel Gabriel, was to be a consecrated virgin in the context of her marriage to St. Joseph, which, if you think about it, is the only way that her particular response makes any sense. But you see, the underlying point for our purposes is that even though Mary's original plan was a good plan, a noble plan, a holy plan even, again, to become a consecrated virgin for the glory of God, God had other plans. His plan, of course, was for her to become the mother of the Savior. And the moment that became abundantly clear to the Blessed Virgin Mary, she consented to God's will for her salvation and the salvation of the world. Hence, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. Now, what's interesting is that in contrast to the Blessed Virgin Mary, Lucia's mother actually struggles to apply the same principle in the context of her own life. And so, for example, at the very beginning of the film, the mayor of Fatima is seen in the town square, basically announcing the names of the various young men who have either been killed in battle or are otherwise missing in action, which prompts Lucia's mother to send up a heartfelt prayer to the Lord. So basically what she says to him is, look, I promise that my family will offer prayer and penance in exchange for the safe return of my son, Manuel. And I also promise that my family will become a model home, a great witness of the faith for the people at large. Now, obviously, on the face of it, this particular petition is really good and noble, right? Because again, she's praying for the safe return of her son, and she's praying that her family will become this model of faith for the surrounding community. But what's interesting is that over the course of the film, we see that Lucia's mother, at least for the most part, becomes one of the chief antagonists to Lucia's own journey of faith. And so, for example, throughout the course of the movie, Lucia's mother struggles to believe that the Blessed Virgin Mary is actually appearing to her daughter such as she's constantly pressuring Lucia to uh, renounce these so-called lies about Mary actually appearing to her. Along the same lines, there's this really dramatic scene partway through the film where Manuel is declared missing in action, as a result of which Lucia's mother is understandably really distraught. But then when Lucia urges her mother to pray to the Blessed Virgin Mary, her mother responds by basically slapping her. And on top of that, when Lucia suggests that they offer up this particular suffering for the conversion of sinners, her mother responds by saying, look, don't make fun of me. And if Manuel does not return, it's basically your fault. Now, obviously, Lucia's mother eventually comes around. But the whole point of sort of highlighting these early struggles that she has in terms of her early faith journey is to emphasize, again, the importance of cultivating a certain holy indifference. Namely, this principle that even though it's good, obviously, to cultivate good and holy plans for the glory of God, we should always be ready to abandon our prior plans the moment God reveals that he has something else in store for our lives, both for our sake, but also for the salvation of the world. Now, just in case you think we're being a little too hard on Lucia's mother, over the course of the movie, it's pretty clear that Lucia herself is struggling with the same thing. And so, for example, upon hearing the news of her brother being missing in action, Lucia takes upon herself to tie this rope around her waist and go around in a circle on her knees for an entire night. But then later on, when Lucia meets with the Blessed Virgin Mary, even though Mary certainly affirms the necessity of prayer and penance to facilitate the salvation of sinners, at the same time, Mary says to Lucia, I don't want you tying tight ropes around your waist. Which speaks to the fact that the act of sacrifice and penance, which is most pleasing to Christ, and therefore most efficacious in the economy of salvation, is not so much the hardest thing that we could possibly do, but rather that which is in accordance with God's particular will for our lives. And of course, that's what we see playing out in the context of the film. And so even though Mary makes it clear again that she doesn't want Lucia to wear a tight rope around her waist, at the same time, it's also abundantly clear that God wants Lucia to offer up her sufferings in the context of her daily life for the salvation of souls. But it doesn't necessarily come as she might expect. And so instead of corporal punishment, she has to endure a misunderstanding, whether we're talking about her family, her friends, her neighbors, even the local politicians. But of course, the challenge in the part of Lucia is that she's got to trust and believe that all these things work for the good for those who love the Lord. All her sufferings ultimately contribute to her salvation and the salvation of the world. Okay, now one final example in this regard, and I'll kind of end with this. And so the very best scene in the entire film arguably takes place in the context of Mary's second apparition, 
where Lucia basically poses to Mary a question as to whether or not the three children can join Mary in the kingdom of heaven sooner rather than later. And in response to her question, Mary basically says to Lucia that Jacinta and Francisco will join her soon, alluding to the fact that they'll shortly die as a result of the Spanish flu. But in regards to Lucia, she says, you have to stay because Jesus has chosen you to be the messenger of faith in Mary's immaculate heart. As a result of which, Lucia is really upset. But then Mary does this really beautiful thing. And so she basically leans down to Lucia, comes down to her level, looks her in the eye, and basically says to her this, One day, a long time from now, I will come for you. I will never leave you alone. Now, obviously, it's a beautiful line, but the thing I want to impress upon you is that this particular promise made to Lucia is not meant exclusively for her, but in a certain sense, it's kind of meant for all of us. And so in a certain sense, our Blessed Mother is saying to all of us, look, even though you are called right now, certainly to struggle and persevere in the context of this pilgrim journey, offering up your prayers with faith, simplicity, and conviction, and offering up your acts of penance and sacrifice in accordance with God's will for the salvation of the world, you got to trust and believe that eventually in time, I will come for you. And I will never leave you alone. So believe, have hope, and love God. And may God bless you all.